back in the 90s, Hank Williams Jr. would introduce the Monday night NFL game with the cry, Are you ready for some football? As we sat on the couch or recliner with our snacks and drinks, we could feel the excitement mount as the game was about to begin. There wasn't a lot of preparation involved besides those snacks and drinks and tuning the TV into the local ABC station. But football wasn't really that big of an event in our family. If you want to talk about preparing for a big event, we need to talk about my mom getting ready for Christmas. For most of my childhood, that meant the whole family going to cut down or choose a live Christmas tree and then decorating the tree together. But mom actually started getting ready way before that. She started her Christmas shopping during the after Christmas sales of the year before. She bought so many presents so far in advance for so many people that she had to have an inventory system to keep straight who was getting what present. It wasn't until we were older that we came to understand why Santa had written numbers on the wrapping of each of our presents. With good though sheepish humor, occasionally we would receive such a package weeks or even months later. It had been rediscovered in the hiding place that was so good, Mom hadn't found the present again in time to give it for Christmas. As we jump into our second Sunday of Advent, we find ourselves in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1. He stated simply, the beginning of the good news. Not the good news, but the beginning of the good news. All of the preparations that Mom made for Christmas were not Christmas, but they made our Christmas experience possible. To help his readers understand what he was about to teach them, Mark refers them to the prophet best known to first century Jews, the prophet Isaiah. He also quotes Malachi. Those of us who take the authority of the Bible <clears throat> as our instruction in faith and practice might find it difficult to understand references to Old Testament prophecies, which clearly had quite a different meaning at the time they were first spoken. For example, Isaiah's prophecy in the 7th century BC, or late 8th century, referred to preparing the people of God for those exiled by Babylon to prepare them to return to Jerusalem and reestablish her central place in their lives. But as the Holy Spirit moves Mark to pen these words, we learn, learn that there is another layer of meaning pointing not to God's work in reestablishing God's people in Jerusalem, but to the good news of Jesus the Anointed One, the Son of God. The two interpretations of the prophecy are consistent in that God sends a messenger in the wilderness who prepares our way to prepare God's way to break into history the timeline of God's people. While John the Baptist isn't Elijah in the literal sense, he is Elijah in the sense that he is modeled after the great prophet. Like Elijah, he wears a camel hair coat and leather belt. Like Elijah, he depends on the food God provides to him in nature. We again see this layering of one truth upon another as God acts consistently from age to age. How John the Baptist prepared the people to prepare the way of the Lord is consistent with how Isaiah prepared the people to prepare the way for the Lord to restore Jerusalem. The people came not for Christian baptism, though that was coming soon, but they came to John the Baptist for the baptism of repentance paired with the confessing of their sins. Repentance means to turn from a former way of looking at life and behaving to a new way, a way aligned with God's justice and mercy as we walk in humble obedience to him in community with our brothers and sisters. The word confess meant to say the same thing as, that is, to agree with what God says is out of alignment with God's will. Later, the Apostle John would write, if we confess our sins, he, meaning God, is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. I'm reminded of the song, People Get Ready, and 
I love the version sung by Seal. I'll put a link down in the description. People get ready. There's a train a-coming. You don't need no baggage. You just get on board. If we want to be prepared for God to do a work in our lives, we can pattern that preparation on how the people prepared for God to return them to Jerusalem through confession and repentance. We can pattern our preparation after how the people from the countryside and city came out to John the Baptizer, confessing their sins and repenting of them. We can simply lay those old burdens down. As the song said, you don't need no baggage. When I was younger, I used to go backpacking for days at a time. I still remember how good that first shower felt when I got home as I was washed clean of all the grime that had accumulated along my journey. It was exhilarating. Did you ever wonder why the whole Judean countryside and all of the people of Jerusalem flocked to confess, repent, and be baptized by John the Baptist? I wonder if it wasn't word of mouth about the release that comes when we face the facts of how we had been living and agree with God that we want something more. We want God to work in our lives. This is my prayer. God, I surrender all my guilt, all my weakness, all my shame to you. Send my transgressions against you and others as far away from me as the east is from the west. Remember my sins no more. Wash me that I might be truly clean. Fill me with your Holy Spirit that I might bear the fruit of love for you and for other people. Make me ready for your work in my life. Amen. People get ready. There's a train a-coming You don't need no baggage You just get on board All you need is faith To hear the diesel's humming Don't need no ticket You just think